Keeping up with security issues across thousands of web assets without the right approach to web application security is a daunting task. Get ahead with web vulnerability scanning automation from NetSparker, a leader in dynamic and interactive application security testing known for its ease of use and accurate results. Detect a wide range of vulnerabilities in all legacy and modern web applications, address security bugs at scale by automating the confirmation process, automatically prioritize vulnerabilities, and assign actionable tickets to the right developers in their native workflows for rapid remediation. For more information on how to scale application security with ease, visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. In our May 27th webcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, we'll explore the latest attacks against DNS and the latest techniques that make it possible to discover and disrupt attacks. In our June 3rd webcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, you will learn about pen testing tools and why every organization should be using them regularly. You'll also get a deep dive into the latest uh, features announced in Core Impact and some of the integrations uh, across their now suite uh, of products. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register today or visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand, which gets you access to the entire archive. Uh, this segment is uh, sponsored by Qualys, securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys to learn more about VMDR, vulnerability management, detection, and response. Here with me is Mr. Matt Alderman in studio this week, Yay! sitting in with us. Very nice. I'm back. I'm back. It's Your so first much, uh, oh episode in the new studio. In the studio. new studio. Yeah, it looks, it looks great. It looks, it's awesome. Amazing. Yes. Mr. Lee Neely is on the lines remotely. Lee, welcome. Uh, good to be here. And, uh, you know, as we're kicking off the week, this is an exciting topic to delve into. I'm really interested to see what Wheel has to say to us because this is cool stuff. Me too. Yes. So quick introduction, Exim is an open source MTA or mail transfer agent used on Linux and Unix operating systems. Philip Hazel released the first version of Exim in 1995, deriving its name from Experimental Internet Mailer. The original code was based on S-Mail and both follow the SendMail-like design model where a single binary controls the function of the MTA. Roughly 60% of internet-facing servers run Exim, and Shodan is reporting more than 4 million are reachable today. On May 4th, 2021, the Qualys research team released 21 nails, 21 unique vulnerabilities in Exim, allowing attackers to modify mail server settings, create new accounts, and when chained together, select exploits could provide an attacker full remote unauthentic unauthenticated code execution and the ability to gain root privileges on the Exim server. Returning to the show today is Qualys researcher Wheel to fill us in on the details. Wheel, welcome to the show. Hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Nice to have you today, Wheel. Um, my first question, I guess, is uh, what was some of the factors that led into the decision to look at the Exim uh, source code? Um, well, um, Exim, as you said, is a widely used uh, server, so it's a, it's a good target for the, the researcher and uh, the, the attackers. So we started with that. Uh, on top of this, uh, two years ago, uh, we published an advisory uh, when we found a critical security issue in Exim. So we, we are a bit uh, familiar with uh, its code base. And uh, well, after the, this release, we we knew that um, there were some public reports uh, stating that uh, uh, some uh, 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 Russian actor linked to the GRU, the, the Foreign Military Intelligence Agency, uh, used the vulnerability to take control of some host and some well, some networks. So we were thinking that it would be a good idea to take another look to the to the Exim code, uh, especially since um, uh, quite a few months or years ago, I, I don't remember exactly, um, the Exim developer added a new, some new um, uh, features, uh, some new security features, and uh, we, we spotted uh, this feature and found that maybe we can find a, a bug or a problem in the design of this feature. So we decided to, to, to take a, yes, a, a deeper look at, uh, at, at this code. So, Wheel, when you dig into the code, 
are, are what kind of tools are you using? Are you looking at the, the, the binaries? Are you looking at the source code directly? I mean, how do you start to take apart a piece of software to look for vulnerabilities? Well, uh, we are focused on uh, open source software. So we, we have the source code and it's much more easy to read the source than the uh, reverse the, the binary. <laughs> so we started with the source code. Uh, as I just said, we, we already knew uh, the exim code, so it was a little bit easier. I mean, the the learning curve was already at the at the kind of plateau, you know. And uh, we don't really use any tool, mm. any automatic tool, static analysis tool, or whatever. We perform the, some manual audit. We read the the change log, the the commit messages from the author, the the modification. Uh, Sometimes we, we we check the the bugzilla, for instance, or the, the, the bug tracker, uh, it may give uh, an idea or, or, or something. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. A code editor, uh, the, the source code, and uh, that's all we need to, to do our audit. Well, when you look at the, the change log and the bug fixes and, and commits, uh, are there certain things you're you're looking for in those? And like, how do those lead sometimes to discovering something? Is it like they fix the bug and the problem is in that bug fix or they fix the bug and you're going to look at all the code that surrounds that fix to go, maybe they introduce something like in a different part of the code further down the chain or before. Yeah, well, it really depends on the project, you know, uh, because uh, every project works differently, works differently. But um, when we know that uh, a big feature uh, lands in the code, mm -hmm. uh, it's a new attack surface because uh, it's not necessarily well tested. Uh, so we, we know that we, we, we will take a look at this code first because uh, we don't know it while we know the other part of the, mm -hmm. of the software. Uh, Sometimes uh, the, the commit messages say, all right, it's a little bit fixed, no, nothing important. And when you dig a little bit, you, you, you find that it's a security issue. And uh, since it is not tagged as a security issue, well, it's not backported in the mm. distributions and yep. in, the, in the packages. So you, you, you can have a, a big problem here. Uh, and yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, well, well I think it's uh, the, the mainly how we, we read the comic messages. Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting problems we have today and have for some time had this problem with open source software because there are so many distributions that are incorporating so many different software packages. They are making decisions based on what the developers flag as a security issue. And if it's not a security issue, I think they're, most of the time they'll put it in like their unstable branch and go, we'll release that when we release the next big you know, version of our right. distribution. But Debian, for example, has done this for a long time. They're only backporting the security issues, which I mean, can also have unintended consequences as well, because you can introduce a bug if you're backporting only certain things, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the, the case of this audit, we, we didn't end up in this situation, but uh, uh, in some previous audits, we found some bugs uh, which were not tagged as security issues while there were uh, some uh, a vulnerability actually some vulnerabilities actually so yeah it's a big problem it's uh part of the the i wouldn't say a problem but uh yeah it's part of the, the yeah the problem <laughs> of the, yeah. with the open source you know you have so many different actors it's really hard to track every every bug every security issue so uh, eventually, you, one distribution will miss the the, the update, the the patch, uh, and uh, you you will have the problem. So, oh, I was wondering is you you mentioned you you were looking into the the commits for the recent changes, but what got you from looking at what's changed to what it looks like to get those twenty one vulnerabilities? You really pretty much had to go and end end through through the product and the source to find them all, or were they clustered or related? I mean, that seems like a jump. Some were related, some, yeah, some were related, absolutely. Uh, some were found while we were uh, writing some proof of concept for the first vulnerability we found during the audit. So uh, it was 
a kind of luck that we, we found this vulnerability. And uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you want an example, for instance, in the last version of Exim, the the, the Exim team wrote uh, uh, a kind of memory management uh, uh, system uh, which should perform some security checks on the on the memory. But mm -hmm. we find an issue with the the security design of this management uh, system. And we used it to to exploit the vulnerabilities. Mm. So you know, each time you you had a big feature, you also often had uh, big problems. Yeah, it's really, it's really good. Now with this set of vulnerabilities, how many were part of the rele the the current version, and how many have been there for for years? Like <laughs> right, because yeah, what well, this is this twenty one? I'm sure you're affecting a lot of different versions and different configurations. I'd imagine. Yeah, sure. Uh, in the twenty one vulnerabilities we found, maybe uh, five five were quite uh, recent, and fifteen. Well, we we couldn't track uh, all the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm before 20, uh, 2004, because uh, that's the, the beginning of the history in the, the Git uh, mm. repository. But amongst the 21 vulnerabilities, I think like maybe 13 or 15 vulnerabilities were already in the code in uh, 2004. Okay, so they're very old bugs. Yeah. <laughs> that still it persisted today. Yeah. yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Similar research to I think the last time you guys did this is... <laughs> They were there for a long, long time. Nobody had discovered them. Yeah, sure. The the Baron Samedit, uh, the Baron Samedit, uh, audit uh, was 10, 10 years old, I think. The bug was 10 years old. But you know, uh, Exim is a really big software. And uh, it's not an easy task to have a general view of the software and know how to find the issues and know how to exploit uh, them. So. Uh, we know that, well, we don't know, but uh, we can suppose that some aggressive teams, attackers teams in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, state uh, uh, agency know uh, Exim really well, but I I'm not sure uh, they will release a, a patch, you know? so. <laughs> Mm. You, you, are, mm. you, you have to, to spend a lot of time auditing it in order to, to have it right. And uh, not many uh, researchers and uh, uh, people uh, want to do it because uh, it's a quite an investment. Well, even amongst the open source maintainers, I would venture to guess, Wheel, that there's very few people, for example, on the Exim team, that know all of the code you know, front to back. Mm -hmm. You likely have teams of people that know this part in this module and this part of the code is that is that kind of what you found especially looking at the commit messages is that it's very distributed across multiple developers yeah sure it's always like this in big projects you know mm. but even if you know uh, most of the code uh, you're a developer you work on the software you add new uh, new features but you you're not necessarily aware of all the security issues mm. or the security the, the the design the the security problems you 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 add in your software it's uh it's another job uh so it's really 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 hard to 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 design and write uh, such a big piece of code without any security problem it's uh much more easier i not i wouldn't say very easy but it's much more easy to write the code and find the bug and then uh, get all the credits for fighting the finding the bug, the bugs. But uh, writing a robust piece of software is really really difficult. And uh, even if you know all this all the, the the code, well, you you eventually we you will have some some uh, some problem. Well, it's even worse than that. In that it's not only a large piece of code, it also is a very old piece of code. There, mm. There's a lot of history, and and you don't even see the commits. Pre-2004. Pre-2004. So yes. there's like all these years before nine that. Nine years of development. Right. That yeah. was happening well before this. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. I think it's a, it's a, a problem with uh, many tools. 
they were not designed in the first place with the security in mind. You know, so you, you can add a fix here and there, but at the end of the day, uh, it's not necessarily uh, well designed from a security point of view. Mm -hmm. Some uh, old tools uh, are really good uh, regarding the security, mm -hmm. but generally they were written uh, with the security in mind. I, I, I think, for instance, of uh, OpenSSH or uh, do our sudo, uh, sudo <laughs> well and uh, some other tools but most of them uh, were not because in the in the 90s or at the end of the 80s the security was not a big deal mm -hmm. yeah and i i think it's really hard to maintain that security going forward if you're working with a chunk of legacy code mm -hmm. that had five to ten years of development like you said wheel in the 80s or 90s and then today you're trying to introduce new features I think you oftentimes can shoot yourself in the foot and either introduce a bug and or security vulnerability just because it, it is has to interact in some capacity with that older code. Is that, that kind of what you found? I guess that's why you're looking at the, yeah. the commits, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. The, 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 the legacy is really easy. Mm -hmm. It's really heavy, you know. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in an ideal world, uh, every, everyone will stop writing new vulnerabilities and redesign the software, but mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of work and uh, yeah. it might take uh, a few years. So when right. people are always ask new features, otherwise they, they, they will uh, use another software, you're, you're kind of stuck with, uh, with what you have. Yeah, how many lines of code do you estimate in Exim? <clears throat> uh, I couldn't say several hundred thousand. Yeah. Hmm. I don't yeah. know. We think about the tech debt, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the the concern back then was get functionality out. It's out. It's there. It's a legacy. Who wants to go rewrite the mail transfer agent from scratch, right? Because that's what you'd basically have to do to fix it. Yeah. Well, some uh, some distributions and some uh, community do that. For instance, OpenBSD uh, uh is kind of specialist <laughs> in rewriting software. So, for instance, they, they, they used to rewrite uh, OpenSSL into LibreSSL. They used to rewrite from scratch, from scratch their, their own uh, SMTPD software. Uh, but uh, it's a, it needs a, a huge amount of, uh, of work and a big task force. In OpenVSD, they're really passionate and uh, dedicated to the security of their software. So uh, it's, it's in the, their AD and in, uh, it's so, but uh, for Linux and uh, especially uh, when you, you have such a big piece of software like Exim, which uh, is uh, available on like dozens of architecture, dozens mm. of systems, uh, well, it's almost impossible to do. Is that? Do you think that's why they, the most distributions go with Exim rather than uh, DJB's QMail? Because when we talk about rewriting the MTA, uh, back when I used to administer send mail, I was like, someone's got to have looked at all the issues here and the headaches across the board working with send mail. And I was like, yeah, DJB wrote QMail like basically because of that. But is QMail not ported to as many architectures or just different in some way? Wheel, I don't know if you've looked at, at QMail before. Uh, it's not an easy question. Um, I think that uh, Debian is the only distribution using uh, Exim by default, but I'm not sure. The The big advantage of Exim is uh, its configurability, its modularity. Mm. <coughs> I mean, you, you can have even the, the weirdest configuration for your mailer. Uh, you can do it with Exim. Uh, Qmail was an attempt uh, actually to, to rewrite from scratch a secure uh, mail software, but uh, uh, I think uh, DGB stopped working on Qmail like 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, rewriting a software is not always the, the end of the travel. Uh, you, you have to maintain it. Right. Uh, and it's, it's really difficult as well. Well, and I think this is the point, right? I, I pulled up because um, I wanted to just get a comparison for everybody. There's like 15 contributors for Exum because it's primarily being maintained, mm -hmm. right? where OpenBSD has like 129 contributors, right? It's almost 10 times as many people contributing. Uh, to your point, they're more passionate about fixing and, and you know addressing security bugs where maybe Exum, because it's more in a maintenance cycle, you're not getting that same level of support for that piece of open source. 
Yeah, and on top of that, uh, amongst the 15 developers on Exim, I think the the core team is uh, quite small. There are maybe three, yeah. and uh, they are all volunteers, so they don't have much time to to be super reactive uh, each time there is a, an issue. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a concern. <clears throat> oh. Was that a factor in you guys offering to help write some of the patches for them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we we knew that uh, it was uh, really hard work to 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 write uh, all the patches for the vulnerabilities, and uh, we also knew that uh, they had uh, some uh, organizational issues, uh, which delays the, the 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 patch publication. So. Uh, we well we we offer uh, we offered them the 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 mm. our well the our time and uh, we wrote uh, 26 patches uh each of them hopefully uh being extensively uh tested here with all the the, the proof of concept and the uh, exploits we are writing but uh it's I mean, we are not uh, Exim developers, so we don't know uh, its code uh, as much as the Exim developers. So we had to be super, super careful when writing the the, the patches, and uh, write really minimal uh, patches, like uh, two, three, five lines of patches to limit the, the issues, mm -hmm. and uh, not modify an unexpected be an unexpected behavior elsewhere. But uh, for a few a few patches we wanted to write, we we had to well to to spend a huge amount of time because the, they were quite extensive, and uh, well we we knew then that uh, it was really really difficult, and uh, well finally the exim team uh, accepted our, our patches, and uh, I think it's uh, I think it's good. Well, eighty-five percent of the, the the codes written in C, so you need some good C programmers yes. out there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I want to just transition um, into like what you can do with some of these vulnerabilities. Wheel in you know one of the the conversations Matt and I were having uh, just this morning was um, one of the things that is stated in the advisory is that it could allow adversaries to create new accounts on the target mail servers. These are local Linux accounts, not necessarily like an account to the MTA. You typically wouldn't have an account, a mail account on the MTA, correct? No, no. Well, there are 21 vulnerabilities. So mm. <laughs> basically, basically, you, you can do whatever you want once you are, have a root account, uh, a root shell on the server. But uh, you can change the configuration at runtime, uh, uh, adding some new, new accounts. Or you can uh, have a, a full control on the host running the server, mm. or running the, the the server, which is a, a much bigger uh, issue. Yeah. So both point. really, like if you have to authenticate yeah. to use an MTA and have an account, you can manipulate that, and also yeah. a local Linux or Unix account as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. What I was trying to figure out was, can these vulnerabilities lead to? creation of mail accounts that would look legitimate that could then launch phishing attacks into an organization because now they have these mail accounts that are real. They're not even spoofed. So I didn't know how far you could exploit these vulnerabilities to launch other potential attacks. Yeah, that's an interesting scenario. You can, you can definitely do, do this, uh, uh, this task, actually. Uh, you, you can... You can Trigger two vulnerabilities, for instance, to get a remote remote root access on this uh, on an Exim server without any authentication. So uh, you you can be completely external to the to the to the Exim server. You you, you can be uh, uh, you, you you can attack it without uh, having a, a mail account on this server. And then once you root on this account, yes, you can uh, create fake accounts. You can uh, start uh, start it as a as a pivot to, to attack a, a new uh, a new server or a new part of the network, you can do uh, whatever you want. And uh, I think that's the kind of uh, attack the very organized group uh, perform with uh, mail servers and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that, because you have access to uh, a huge amount of uh, services and, uh, and people. Uh, and yeah, that, that's why uh, it's a very 
I wouldn't say good, but very important target for the researchers and the, and the attackers. Yeah. I mean, the, the ability to take over a box that a corporation owns to create valid looking accounts that are used in a malicious way mm -hmm. is how we propagate malware, ransomware, and all these types of attacks. And two vulnerabilities, unauthenticated, and I have full control of the box. That's a scary scenario. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I don't know how these uh, vulnerabilities were ranked, uh, but uh, it's really, uh, really scary. Uh, the, you know, the re remote uh, root access, the remote code execution uh, as root is the kind of, uh, of Graal, <laughs> of Graal, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you, you can you use uh, the, the, the box to, as you said, uh, uh, organize a, a massive uh, mail phishing attack or whatever. You can uh, use it as a, as a pivot for something else. You can do absolutely whatever you want. You can stay silent for very long and then uh, use it for denial, uh, denial of service, or distributed denial of service or whatever. It's yeah. uh, it's quite scary. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's crazy because you're basically the the administrator of the MTA mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah, and so that means you yeah. can do anything an administrator could do, which could be reroute mail, create new mm -hmm. accounts, remove security controls. You can do whatever you want. Deny I mean, mail. Like l let's say that you use you stay silent. You craft all this, and and we've seen scenarios of this with Solar Winds, right? You stay silent for a while, and and you set up. Uh, a command and control capability, very sophisticated, to the point where not only do you, once you launch a phishing attack to gain access to maybe launch a ransomware attack, then you could literally do a denial of service and shut down all mail, which means all, communi right. all communication shut down on top of it. So you can't even communicate potentially with people during the actual attack. I mean, that would be a little crazy. Also, you know, yeah. I, I'd like all password reset emails to come to me and not the end user. Mm. That's certainly doable. Yeah, as well. now I have now <laughs> yeah. I have potentially domain account access. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. The uh, the mail servers, the remote uh, remote servers, are a scary thing. Yeah, I, I find it interesting, and I'm not sure how you know many enterprises are set up in perhaps using Exim in some capacity. I'd imagine it's also included with other products uh, as the MTA. Uh, agent, but one scenario I was thinking of is that if you've got a secure email gateway, and that's where all of your mail is being delivered, mm -hmm. and that secure email gateway is then delivering to your uh, MTA that's running Exim, that you would want to filter that not just on the host side, but filter that on the network side so that, I mean, in the MTA, I can say, hey, Exim, only accept mail from my secure email gateway, right? But that means port 25 could be exposed to the internet as well. So I think it it's a calling for people to look at their architecture to see what's available and basically not trust the MTA itself to put controls in place that allow for the flowing of mail, but to also use network firewall rules yeah, uh, as well, sure. correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I would hope you'd also be doing some monitoring on your MTA for and other services like that for unauthorized account creation and some other things that might yep. give you a heads up beyond just whether you've got the right patched version of your software. Detect some malfeasance before it happens, before it goes un unchecked. Sure, but it's uh, if you're really sophisticated, you can uh, maybe disable this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or make it silent. Right. right. But how many people do that? I mean, th that's. I mean, this goes back to the supply chain, right? It, it's a piece of code included in distribution. If you don't know it's there or you're not doing it, right? I mean, it, it, it's one of those cases where without understanding all the dependencies in the code that you have or have out there, I mean, these create interesting backdoors if not protected or removed or or something done with them and the, and there's so many distributions you know i think what four million servers sitting out there with the, with this default uh uh capability and it's a little scary yeah 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 it's scary but uh, i want to to say that the survey uh, or shodan uh, i don't remember exactly says that it's four million exim servers but it's it's hard to say the, if this uh, number is really accurate, you know, mm. because uh, m I think every uh, every Linux, every Debian uh, installed uh, a long time ago has uh, an Exim server running on it, 
So it may be not an interesting target. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just a, a, an average Joe uh, system. Uh, maybe a more interesting metric would be to know how many users uh, every server uh, manages. Mm -hmm. mm. Right, to see what the user total yeah. user count or, or the, where the potential attack surface is across yeah. all those accounts. Right? Other, otherwise, it's interesting from a, a, a network point of view. I mean, if you want to, to coordinate an attack with a lot of, a lot of hosts, well, well, it's interesting. But if you want to know if uh, Exim is used in a big, big architecture, you have to check the number of users. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are these vulnerabilities largely accessible independent of the configuration of Exim? In other words, if I install Debian, it puts Exim there, you know, by default. Um, is that configure those types of configurations vulnerable, or do you want to get yourself yeah. into trouble? Like if you're actually using the MTA in a, in in more of a capa like standard capacity. Mm, I think that uh, most of the vulnerabilities are available in the default Exim configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But you, you have to take care of the exim version because uh, some of the vulnerabilities uh, uh, target only the exim version until the 4.92, some other until the, the latest version. So you can't combine all the vulnerabilities all together. You have to, to, to pick, <laughs> right. to cherry pick the vulnerability. Yeah, pick and choose based on which version's running to see yeah. if I can string yeah. those two unauthenticated vulnerabilities together to get root may not exist yeah. in every version, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So how tempting was it to go look at other MTAs that were out there for similar, similar vulnerabilities? I mean, I took a look at that list that you have in your blog and I'm going, I'm wondering how much of that behavior exists elsewhere because it could it's behavior that's potentially there. Mm. Uh, it's tempting, but uh, we, did, <laughs> uh, we didn't check for now all the softwares. Maybe we'll look at the, at the at postfix or sendmail or whatever. But uh, anyway, even if we were working on, uh, on them, uh, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> good answer wheel good answer yeah. but, but i mean it's it's a good point too um you know with the previous vulnerability we discussed wheel it was pseudo and there really i mean there is like one pseudo based code uh in this example when it's an mta uh lee it's a great you know observing a great point that they are other mtas could behave similarly and potentially yeah. have have similar issues sort of yeah the corrupted input is uh, really easy to check on uh, any server, you know. Yeah. You, you send a packet with a corrupt, corrupted input and uh, you see what happens. And some of these vulnerabilities will, uh, the more severe ones, require a certain amount of memory. Did I read that correctly in some of the descriptions? Well, only, I mean, we, uh, there were uh, 10 remote vulnerabilities and uh, 11 local vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we managed to exploit four local privilege exploitation and three of uh, three remote code executions. But one of the um, of the the exploitation needed uh, around 25 gigs of memory. So theoretic theory. <laughs> That's okay. Theory. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. In theory, mm. uh, it's vulnerable. Uh, from a practical point of view, you just uh, choose another another exploit, another vulnerability to exploit, mm. uh, which is much more easy. I gotcha. I, I mean, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, one authenticated uh, remote code access, remote uh, code execution. Uh, in the vulnerabilities. So as long as you already have an account on the server, you get the root instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, alongside you, you have a, a non-authenticated uh, remote uh, uh, code execution, which leads you to, to have an Exim account on the server. And uh, once you have the Exim account, it's, uh, it, was, it was trivial to, to become root. Mm. So, so yeah, it's so interesting, you know, you know if even if Shodan is reporting 4 million, Many distributions have Exim on there that may not have SMTP yeah. ports exposed, right. which means if you've got a vulnerable web app and you need to um, escalate privileges, it comes standard with most distributions. So it could right. be running to send outgoing mail but not receive incoming mail. So this could be a, yeah. a good path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's why you have to take care when you 
just read at the numbers. Anyway, I think uh, Exim and Postfix are the two main uh, uh, mail servers. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if uh, Exim doesn't have 4 million servers running, it's, uh, it's a good target. Yeah, it's a larger footprint, potentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in if you get full root, right, then you can do some lateral movement, which could get you to some other systems, which mm -hmm. could be used as an entry to get to another system that maybe has more information. Even if it's not being used in, in the mail transfer component, I could still use it as a lateral movement point and get to a web server or some other place in the organization and create right. another attack. Well, yeah, because I've often seen it, you know, there's multiple uses for an MTA. And the way I've seen it in the context of Exim as an example is that there are applications running. And those are yeah. business applications. Those are like sometimes like Nagios or monitoring applications, applications for IT purposes that have an MTA so they can send you yeah. alerts. So like right. if Nagios sees a box is down, like it needs a way to send email. Oftentimes administrators will just configure that locally. So this is, could be widespread in that use case. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Which I, I think so. is kind of one of the, my defensive measures would be if everyone is making this push to the cloud in some capacity. And I think it's one of the things that is on our radar here at Security Weekly as well. I'm like, I don't want to be responsible for an MTA in any capacity. I want it to have a provider, like a cloud provider for my corporate email and have them manage the MTA aspect of it. And for my applications and services, inside of one of my cloud providers, I want to use their cloud native service that can send email. Then I don't have to, to worry about it. Okay, so think about this. Now I'm running infrastructure as a service mm -hmm. and I'm spinning up Debian hosts. If I don't go protect that MTA. You gotta remove it. I gotta remove it, right? Yep. I need to protect it. Otherwise, guess what? The attack vector's still there even though you might not be using it Correct. for a mail purpose. Correct. So we, you've given our audience, I think, a lot of homework to do. <laughs> And looking at the various <laughs> yeah. MTA usage, right, uh, in your environment. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those cloud native services require some architecture and expertise in the cloud providers to learn how to configure. I mean, that's a whole other vulnerability. Potentially, you have to configure that properly. Mm -hmm. Then you have to tune all your applications and services to use that, which could mean some development time, which could mean some configuration time to say my monitoring services. Now you're going to send email here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Any other defensive uh, recommendations, Wheel? Uh, <laughs> Besides remove it? Re remove it? If you're not going to remove it, patch it, right? I, mean, uh, no, really... I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, but, well, the recommendation will always, will always depend on the on the administration and the, 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 the network, the administration, and the constraints. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't tell any recommendation from a administration point of view uh, from a developer point of view i would say maybe stop writing code in c yeah <laughs> but uh, i need some c code to 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 work you know mm. uh, so uh, well no 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 recommendation interesting so. remove it or patch it that's our recommendation not, that's not ours. wheels just for yeah, the record that's ours. Yeah, yeah yeah remove it or patch it remove and it or patch it if you remove it you're gonna have to mig migrate it is really what we're advocating for yeah you're still I mean, gonna have you're, applications if, to send email right if you're using it then put some protections around it if you're not using it remove it and the fastest right. way if you're using it to fix it is probably to apply the patches to protect it right. better yeah i mean i i will say this from my experience having worked with SendMail, postfix qmail and Exim in my, you know, certain points in my career, more so than others being a, a Unix and Linux admin, I, I kind of came to the conclusion where like, I don't want to maintain my own MTA. I mean, for a whole host of reasons, this just being one of them, but for a whole host of reasons, there is uh, uh, so many aspects to setting up a, a mail server just to send mm -hmm. email, just to have legitimate email flow today. I mean, you have to go through all kinds of steps yeah. in DNS, in the various uh, secure protocols in SMTP, authentication of the users. Like there's a yeah. lot to take on there. If you're gonna take on the MTA yourself, you have to put the appropriate resources behind it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 cannot take just you cannot just take the MTA and say, okay, I will configure it and it will work out of the box. Mm -hmm. You have to to take account of the, the, the all the components working with the MTA and it's a, a full part job. You yep. you can't just uh, 
say out of the blue, oh, okay, let's do it. And uh, at the end of the day, it will work. Uh, no worries. Mm. Well, remember, you, we we used to set up applications and, and, and rather than worry about all the complexities of our security, we would stick a, an MTA on there or just hand everything to the organization's default mail relay. And it was easy until those things started implementing security. Yes, and exactly. And I'll bet those MTAs weren't really uninstalled when we stopped using them. Yep. Yeah, you end up with a lot of legacy stuff out there. Yeah. Those I are can't fun wait. Times, though. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I can't wait until you find the next one because you've done two really great research projects Agreed. here in the last what few months between the pseudo one and, and this one, I can't wait for the next one wheel because you, you guys find some really interesting stuff. I can't wait, uh, wait as well, but mm -hmm. I couldn't say anything. I know, I know. Yeah, uh, that's all right. We are we, we, we always working on some vulnerabilities and some bugs we have in mind, but uh, we don't know how much time it will take to publish it or how much time it will take to, to finish the research sometimes. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I said earlier, you, you find just a little big, a little, a little issue, a very tiny issue, and you... you you dig, you dig, you dig, and you find something really big, and you, you need like three months or four months to, to perform the whole, the whole uh, audit. So maybe the next one will be interesting. I hope so. <laughs> uh, but uh, we obviously cannot guarantee that we will find some uh, huge uh, vulnerability <laughs> issues like in uh, sudo or, or exim. Mm. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, we will find something cool. Stay tuned. Yeah, and I, I really, I really love wheel that uh, yourself and the Qualys research team and Qualys itself was uh, offered assistance with the patches uh, for the team uh, at Exim. You know, that I think that sends a positive message to the community and shows you're you're just not picking on open source projects. Like, if you do find vulnerabilities, you're there to help and support uh, these projects, so we can all be more secure. And, and we appreciate that. Yeah, it's very, it's very important. You know. In the security world, it's often that you, you see the attacker point of view as, uh, as a really cool and really good, and uh, then uh, you, every, everybody is happy with your work. But the, one of the hard uh, work is to, to help the developers and mm -hmm. uh, to write the patches, to see, uh, to, to, to put yourself in their boots and know how it right. really works from, uh, from the beginning to the end of the process. And uh, just pointing at, uh, at the, the finger at the, at the software and say, oh, look at this one. There are, there are a lot of issues with this. It's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier than uh, provide some help. Yeah. No. And at the end of the day, you're, you're happy when you know that your work uh, really help uh, securing a lot of systems. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the research is actually benefiting the community in these softwares to be more secure because a lot of people yeah. don't realize how many vulnerabilities are sitting some of this old legacy code and it's 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 a yeah. huge effort and it's it's well rewarded uh, i think at the end of the and, day and also shining a light on it too through the calls uh product now you've got you know plugins that are uh, highlighting these flaws in everyone else's uh networks as well that are running calls and now can see these come up and i think uh you've taken the right approach into raising awareness about about these vulnerabilities which is really one of the only ways people pay attention and start fixing stuff yeah, sure. But it's I not mean, just it's, raising... It's our responsibility. It's, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, we are part of Qualys. So Qualys is a security uh, company. So it's our responsibility to to offer some uh, good solutions to the, the software developers and software maintainers. You know, we, 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 we want to contribute to make uh, the, the whole system better and uh, more secure than that just it. I, not to get mundane, but it's one thing to say that and quite another thing to do it. You're walking the talk, which is really awesome and, and yeah. really a awesome addition to our community. I, I, I'd like to see more do it. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we'll thank you so much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you everybody. Uh, to learn more about Qualys, folks can visit securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. That will conclude the episode for this evening. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Over and out.